Get Rich Education is brought to you by Mid-South Homebuyers and TheLandGeek.com. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. You're listening to Get Rich Education, episode 42. Welcome in. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. From my birthplace along the Schuylkill River in historic Pennsylvania to my home place beneath the Chugach Mountains in beautiful and pristine Anchorage, Alaska, and everywhere else in between, you're listening to the show that has changed your mindset and the way you think about your future. You're helping me turn more nobodies into somebodies than anybody, and I really appreciate that you're here. I'm back for another week to ask, what can I do to improve your wealth? And today, perhaps even a more relevant question is, what can you do to improve your children's wealth today at the same time? Can you make them think about money in a way other than the way that you thought about money when your parents raised you? How do you plant that abundance mentality seed in others at a young age rather than the scarcity mentality seed that usually gets planted and then never grows larger than a financial sprout? And you will get great perspective whether you are a parent or not because you're going to think about your upbringing and how that shapes your future choices. Now, I had an upbringing sprinkled with more abundant mental fertilizer than most childhoods for sure. But as a kid, I still heard some of those scarcity phrases that made me think twice in my decision making. You know, I spent my adolescent life really not caring about money. It wasn't until I started working eight-hour days that my perspective almost completely 180'd. After early disillusionment with full-time job working, I thought, my gosh, is this what everyone really aspires to do? Get a J-O-B just to live for the holidays, weekends, and only two weeks of vacation time? I mean, it's virtuous to be productive, sure, but to put oneself in a situation where they have no option other than to have to work at a -a workaday job for the majority of their productive life, or else they will endure financial hardship for themselves and their family? I mean, that's almost ridiculous. Well, soon I found it even more incredible that people take loads of time and effort learning about how work works. They don't spend any time learning about how money works, and yet money is the only reason that people go to work, (laughs) okay? That was the takeaway that made me start to care about money and learn that it really does matter. And hey, well, today we've got the honor of having the truly incomparable Sharon Lecter to speak to all this, so let's meet Sharon. My next guest, Sharon Lecter, is regarded as a global expert on financial literacy. She has served as a national spokeswoman and presidential advisor on the topic to both George W. Bush and President Obama. Sharon is an entrepreneur, author, philanthropist, international speaker, licensed CPA, chartered global management accountant, and most importantly, maybe a mother and a grandmother. Sharon has been a pioneer in developing new technologies, programs to bring education into children's lives, particularly financial literacy. So going back here a little bit, since 1992, she really then dedicated her professional life to creating and distributing financial education books and other learning products. In 1997, Sharon co-authored the international bestseller, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And you know, I think a lot of times someone gets more credit for authoring that book, but by a lot of accounts, my guest today, Sharon, had more to do with authoring that book perhaps than anybody. She also authored 14 other books in the Rich Dad series. She spent more than 10 years as CEO, leading the Rich Dad company and brand into an international powerhouse. 
Fast forward to 2008, Sharon was asked by the Napoleon Hill Foundation to help re-energize the powerful teachings of Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich. Sharon released three best-selling books in cooperation with the Napoleon Hill Foundation, including Think and Grow Rich for Women. That was released in June of 2014. Sharon's financial literacy board game, Thrive Time for Teens, has received numerous coveted awards. If that's not enough, Sharon was the driving force behind the passage of Arizona Senate Bill 1449 in June of 2013. That's a bill that requires financial literacy concepts to be permanently incorporated into economic standards, and it created a separate statute just for those concepts. Is that really the resume of one person? That sounds like four different people doing those things over the years, but that is all in one person's experience and accomplishments, so we're so honored to have you with us today. Welcome to Get Rich Education, Sharon Lecter. Well, thank you, Keith. I am delighted to be with you. Well, you've completely out-credentialed me here, so you've made me feel small. <laughs> no, no, no. Just uh, based on our relative ages, I think uh, you're, you're doing beautifully and can't wait to read your resume in a few years. <laughs> you give me a lot to aim for there. So the Rich Dad arc of this show would be incomplete without you. And where does it all begin? You know, they say that education starts at home, and that certainly includes financial education. So, you know, I want to discuss a little bit about what a parent can do to ensure that their child gets the appropriate financial education, Sharon. And, you know, I want to think of it, I think, in terms of of scarcity and abundance, too, because I think when a child's young, they get introduced to a lot of scarcity concepts, and that sticks with them for their entire lives. What do you think about that? Well, absolutely. I I always ask people, what did your parents say about money? Typically, it's money didn't grow on trees. Who do you think we are? The Rockefellers. Um, We need to penny pinch. We can't afford it. All all of those statements have one thing in common. They're negative. negative. So as a child, we end up with this negative imprint about money becomes an emotional subject that builds a mindset of scarcity. And today, many of us still say, I can't afford it. So I say, let's You know, when you're talking to your children or even for yourself, stop saying, I can't afford it. What that does is closes your mind. It's a negative statement. You tend to go within yourself and kind of like almost, you know, cringe. Instead, say, how can I afford it? Because when you say, how can I afford it? Or to a child, well, Susie, how can you afford it? It triggers and ignites an entrepreneurial spirit. It opens the mind to wanting to solve the riddle. How can I afford it? What can I do to earn the money? And what you do is you go from scarcity to abundance just by changing the words that you use when you speak to yourself and to your children about money. Right. One's a lot more likely to become a problem solver than a problem builder when they ask, how can I do it, rather than say, I can't do it. Well, that's absolutely. And I can't tends to take, basically chip away at self-confidence, chip away at self-esteem. But how can I means, you know, I know I can. I just have to figure out how. Now, a lot of times as children, I think we're told, and I was certainly told the same thing, Sharon. That saving is a virtue. You should save money. You should delay gratification. That's deemed as something good, and then you can be rewarded at the end after you've saved. However, as that child grows up into an adult, you know, we're an investing show. Is it really the right thing when one gets older to continue to tell that person to save? Because a child probably wouldn't understand investing, but an adult would. Well, I always teach um, parents that it's really you want from an early age to talk about the you know the various piggy banks. One is for saving because we all need to have our little emergency fund even as adults. One is for investing. One is for giving back charity, and one is for spending. So that's four buckets, and. So you can start talking about that at an early age. So a child understands that in their spending category, um, that's what they need to budget and use for buying things, the toys that they want. For saving, it's kind of like saving up for that bigger purchase or for giving somebody else a gift. Tithing or giving back is how you share your wealth with others and with the community, whether it be your church 
or through a charity that you believe in. And then investing in a child, you know, investing can be as much as buying silver coins. I mean, that's one of the things I give my grandchildren is silver coins. So for them, it's fun because they can go online and track how much their uh, silver is worth. So you start basically engaging those concepts at a very early age where they're open to anything and everything. And so as they get older, then they're going to continue to think about the difference between saving, spending, giving, and investing. That's really a great idea about the silver coin and using that approach to get children interested in investing, I think, because that's something a child can point to and that they can have and understand because it's very tangible. Well, and I have a lot of people that do buy, you know, if somebody, a child is a, you know, loves McDonald's or loves Toys R Us, that they buy a, a, a share of stock for them in that company and they start building their portfolio. So there's nothing wrong with doing that either. Either one of them works. So, you know, I think some of what a child is told, maybe when they get a little bit older, age 10, age 12, you know, one thing a child's commonly told is either live within your means or live below your means. And living below one's means, to me, that's really one of the most damaging phraseologies that you can tell a person and stifle their ambition. So, you know, I'm more of practicing, why don't you just use those same efforts to expand your means rather than live below your means? What would you tell a child or maybe a young adolescent about living within one's means? Well, you just uh, took the words out of my mouth. I tell tell adults and children, I said, you know, it's one thing to be a penny pincher, and it's one thing to keep focusing on living below your means, but I would rather spend your time and energy in thinking of ways you can expand your means. We do live in a world of abundance. What else can you do? How can you expand your means to live the life you choose? And if you think about that, then you actually ignite and tie into that entrepreneurial spirit, the same as you do when you say, how can I? It makes sense that I would have taken the words out of your mouth because that's one of my favorite phrases. Don't live below your means, expand your means. And that comes from Rich Dad, which you (laughs) helped uh, found. So that actually lines up just how it should. What's a good example, do you think, especially for maybe a child or a young adolescent about don't live below your means, expand your means. Well, I think from a standpoint of a messaging to a child is, you know, let's go back to the basis of building self-confidence and self-esteem. One of the biggest issues we have today is something called instant gratification. And, you know, some people go to the point of saying entitlement, but where did that entitlement come from? It came from instant gratification. Parents today want their kids to have what they didn't have. And it's so important. When I was growing up, you know, eons ago, there weren't credit cards. So if I wanted something, I had to set a goal, plan for it, and then work towards getting what the money accumulated and then go buy the purchase. Well, in that process, I built great confidence and great self-esteem. And so today I tell parents, you know, you don't let go of that concept. Allow your children to want something Have them set a goal, and it can be a small goal, but have them achieve it and then celebrate them achieving that goal. And that's how you build self-confidence. That's how you build the ability to understand that I can do it. I did it. I can do it again. Instead of this, I want the toy, mom, I want the toy, okay, here it is. That's instant gratification, and it kind of builds this like expectation of entitlement. Instead, let's say, okay, you want that? Well, you know, obviously that's going to cost 50 bucks, you know, maybe a new game for your Xbox or something. And so you sit down and say, so you get an allowance, but how many weeks is it going to take you to save enough allowance to buy that? What else can you do? to support and help around the house or to help mom and dad to get the money that you need to buy the game. Uh As opposed to, okay, well, let's get in the car and go to Toys R Us and get it. Yeah, that's a good actionable example that a parent can tell a child. Part of teaching a child financial education, you might agree, is, um, you know, we're talking about how money works. Maybe it's going ahead and giving a child some good examples and some symbolism about how businesses work. How can you teach a child about how businesses work and how can that help them? 
Well, I could make this a promotional moment. I do have a product called My Biz Kit for young people to learn how to start their own business. But I have a eight-year-old grandson who came to one of my last events with his artwork, and he sat in the back of the room and sold his artwork. It was a, it was perfect. I was so proud of him. But the, the issue is giving them those concepts, because once a child knows how to make money on their own, it's the gift of a lifetime. So it's very important as adults that we teach our young people about entrepreneurship, even if they're going to be employees later on. That gift of understanding that they can do it on their own makes them less dependent on their employer. Because at the end of the day, each and every one of us are either a master of our money or a slave to it. And unfortunately, way too many young people coming out of college today are heavily in debt, school loan debt, credit card debt. And so they start their lives as a slave to money. And that's not good. It's not a good thing. And so as our young people are growing up, if we can give them the tools to build self-confidence, if we can give them the tools to understand how they can make more money, that's a gift that they will take with them for the rest of their lives. And as an example, when we talk about teaching our kids about money, part of it starts with just the conversations you have with children. When you're at a fast food restaurant, say at McDonald's, it's not like you sit down and have a lesson, but as you live your life, you open their eyes to the world of business around them. You go to McDonald's, you're sitting there having your burger, and um, you say, you know, the owner of this restaurant isn't here because it's run by a bunch of teenagers and he may own five or six of these or even more. And he knows that he's got systems and people that run this business for him and he just gets the money at the end of the month. And when you look at the hamburger you're eating, you know, this wrapper that this box that the hamburger is in, that's made by a whole nother company. And that's all they do is make these boxes. And the straw you're drinking, same thing. Again, just talking about the world of business and how they start seeing things come together. And it builds their awareness of businesses and the economic wheel that turns businesses. Gosh, I love it. That type of thing and telling a child that could spur so many questions into how the world works, how the economy works, why they're there now. They might even be surprised to learn that 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 restaurant wouldn't exist unless it makes money. So as that child matures into an adolescent and young adulthood, maybe they end up becoming a real estate investor or an entrepreneur, which is something we talk about a lot on this show. You know, they have a decision to make first, whether to go to college or not. And I talked a few shows ago for a a segment, Sharon, on pointing out to my audience that the cost of a college education has gone up in recent years, even in an inflation-adjusted basis, yet the value of the college education at the same time arguably has gone down. So I want to ask you, someone that's advised President Obama and George W. Bush on financial literacy, is college worth it today? Keith, there's a really a a multiple prong answer to that question. So let me start kind of like at the first point. Studies have shown that the value of a college education still generates lifelong higher earnings for someone than someone who has a high school graduation certificate. And yet, if you look at high school graduates today, they are much more immature than they were 10 years ago. And so are they ready to have that college experience? On one side, they get there and they tend to flail a little bit. Their freshman year is kind of crazy because all of a sudden they're having to learn quickly, you know, into the frying pan how to live on their own because they haven't developed those skills at home. And so the freshman year sometimes is a wasted year. But also those high school graduates today, because they're less immature, are they really ready to get out into the real world at that age? And so there's almost, I think, a need to reevaluate the system because these kids are more immature. But I do believe a college education is still beneficial in the long term. However, Having said that, if you don't have the money for a college education and you have to borrow the money, I truly recommend that you don't go to college unless you truly know what you want to do. Many young people are graduating today with very deeply in college debt. 
$150,000 in debt, and they're graduating with degrees like liberal arts degrees where they can't ever get a job that pays them enough to really pay down that debt. In fact, I'm working on a bill right now with uh, Representative Matt Salmon in Washington that would require anyone getting a federally backed student loan to have financial education. If we're going to give them some money, why don't we give them some education on how to use it and hopefully keep them from getting in severe debt? Because I truly, as I said, this is a, a huge issue in America and many young people, they end up getting in such a deep hole before they even start making money that it's very difficult for them to get out of it. Yeah, that's true. I think when kids start thinking about finances in college, one of the first prompts they get is uh, owning and controlling their first credit card, and they, they don't know how to control that either. Actually, my oldest son went off to college in 1992, and uh, between September and December got himself in credit card debt, and I was pretty upset with him, I was, but I was more upset with me, and that was December of 1992, and that's really when I dedicated the rest of my career to financial education, because you see, he was with me when I used my credit cards, but he wasn't with me when I paid them off every month. And he got to campus and he had uh, the walk through the platoon of uh, tables saying, here's some free pizza, free money, somebody else, free T-shirt, free money. And he got um, in love with the idea and certainly got himself into debt. It took him uh, seven years to get out of debt and repair his credit, but it was the best lesson we ever did by not bailing him out. But at that time, you know, that was when I really dedicated myself to this subject. And when I was with the President's Advisory Council for Financial Literacy, the Credit Card Act was passed in 2009. And so part of that bill prohibits credit card companies from marketing to students on campus. So it were, I can't take credit for the bill, but I can certainly take credit for being a squeaky wheel about it. So now the credit card companies can't solicit children on campus or within a thousand feet, I think it is, of college activities. So it's still an issue, but it's not, at least they're not breathing down their necks. So I experienced that personally when I went to college in the 90s. The first ever credit card I applied for, it was at a folding leg table that someone had set up in the middle of campus outdoors. And my incentive for applying for the credit card was because I got a free two liter bottle of soda. I knew what that was, but I did not know what an 18% APR was when I was 18. And boy, was that a cheap cost for a lead for that credit card company, right? <laughs> yeah, and one expensive soda bottle. <laughs> You're listening to Get Rich Education. My guest is presidential advisor and Think and Grow Rich for Women author, Sharon Lecter. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Are you looking for a way to build monthly cash flow investing in real estate, but without the typical hassles you hear about? While other people flock to compete in the house flipping and rental property markets, now could be the time to learn migraine-free real estate investing. In business for nearly 15 years, Mark Podolsky, aka The Land Geek, has unlocked the secrets to creating significant passive income by investing in raw, undeveloped land. No renters or tenants, no rodents or termites, no renovations or toilet repairs. Imagine achieving your financial goals without suffering through the constant stress that landlords and house flippers do. For more information, go to thelandgeek.com slash GRE. This is entrepreneur on fires, John Lee Dumas. Don't follow money, make money follow you with Get Rich Education. Welcome back to Get Rich Education with longtime former CEO of the Rich Dad Company, Sharon Lecter. Sharon, I have a lot of real estate investors on my show, and that's probably reflected on them and back to me because I've been a, a pretty successful real estate investor myself, according to what some people say. So serving as presidential advisor to both the Bush and Obama administrations, which president do you think would have a better chance of calculating an apartment building cap rate, Bush or Obama? <laughs> <laughs> I really ask that, yes. <laughs> well, I would tell you they both would never do it on their own. They would have some advisor do it for them. But I would tell you the one probably most adept at requiring that information would be President Bush. I know it's pretty common for politicians to invest in real estate. Well, if you think about the, the globally, the rich either 
gain their wealth through real estate or hold their wealth. They might have become rich through companies or other methods, but a lot of them hold their wealth in real estate. So real estate investing is a very tried and true proven method of holding and growing wealth. Sometimes people get a little overzealous and they get themselves upside down. You, you, know, you want to have your real estate holdings so that you can withstand market corrections. And it wasn't the real estate that was the problem. It was the debt attached to that real estate that was the problem. So coming from your broad perspective and being such an influential financial educator, how does real estate compare to other asset classes when you consider real estate's durability, the control one can have over it, the utility, the leverage, the tax advantages? How does it measure up from your perspective? Well, there aren't too many other assets where that you can put a small amount down, say 20%, and uh, have the bank provide you the rest of the capital to invest in that real estate, and yet you still have 100% ownership, you have 100% of the tax advantages, 100% of the growth in equity or growth in market value in the future. So there aren't any other assets that qualify for that. So definitely real estate gives you the, the best opportunity to grow your wealth through leverage. But that's when you sometimes get a little greedy and get a little hungry and people get over leveraged. And that's the part where you have to educate yourself and understand, you know, let's have that positive cash flow every month. And let's make sure our debt isn't so that it's going to be really upside down based on market corrections. Does it ha sometimes happen? Yes. So, for instance, I had a house that technically was upside down, but it was still generating positive cash flow. And so I didn't get all upset and worried. I just maintained the payments and I had the ca positive cash flow. And now I'm, you know, I'm right side up again. Each investor needs to say, what is my tolerance for risk? How much debt can I actually carry and, and be able to sleep at night and have that debt be good debt where your tenants are paying for that debt and make sure your bad debt is very small? And if you look at retirement assets, you can't borrow for retirement, but you can borrow to invest in real estate that can generate positive cash flow. Wow. You're saying a lot of the same stuff I say on my show, and you're just bringing it a different way. This is great reinforcement for my audience. I've talked about an example like that where I have been underwater on a fourplex building, but because I first considered the market being more important than the property, even during that period of time I was underwater, it was producing terrific cash flow, so it hardly mattered. That's right. You know, and a lot of people will say, well, I'm going to make a little bit of negative cash flow, but I'm going to, you know, when I get the tax benefits, it'll be positive. And I say, let's, you know, just ask yourself, how many properties can you truly hold if you have a negative amount that you have to feed every month? You know, that's a limited number, but how many properties can you own that are giving you positive cash flow every month? As many as you can get your hands on. And so cash flow, monthly cash flow is a very important measure. You know, the concept of negative gearing or negative cash flow that you get made up in taxes is a very dangerous area to be in. And what's your latest book about, Sharon? Well, my latest book is Think and Grow Rich for Women. It came out last year, just newly released in paperback this last week. So I took the original work of Think and Grow Rich, which was released in 1937. And at that time, there were no women in business. And so I wanted to honor Hill's work. But then I looked at each of his 13 steps. So I follow the same chapter outline. And I look at each of those steps through the eyes of successful women. Then I talk about how I've used those steps in my own career. And then I have a series of quotes that I call Sisterhood Mastermind from women of history, women in politics, women CEOs, women entrepreneurs. And I really wanted to provide a reference for women looking to get support from other women. Over 300 women are highlighted in the book. And it really is, I've just been thrilled with the response we've had. Even though the steps of success are the same for men and women, we tend to approach them very differently. And so that book is still very, very much a uh, present and, and being promoted. And then I'm working on two additional books with the Napoleon Hill Foundation, Think and Grow Rich for the Next Generation, and then Think and Grow Rich, The Magic Key, talking to entrepreneurs who created a huge business with their ideas and then also are giving back to improve the world. What an honor that must have been to be asked by the Napoleon Hill Foundation to, to author those books and have that influence. 
Well, it's been a tremendous working relationship. Um, They're very supportive of my work through Pay Your Family First. You know, I also, the things that I'm working on, I finished and just released earlier this year an entire adult curriculum on financial literacy. And it's your money mastery. And it is something that is offered and available for college courses across the country. So I was pretty excited about that. Well, Sharon, with all the exposure that you have to financial education resources, I think you're a great person to ask for a good internet resource for productivity or a wealth building website or app. Well, Keith, um, it just so happens we've just launched a new program. It's called LinkedIn Success. You can go to www.linkedin-success.com. It's a program that sits on the back of your LinkedIn account, and I have tried and spent thousands, probably closer to millions of dollars on various internet marketing methods, and I've actually never gotten a return on my investment that was sufficient to justify the expense until now. And this particular program I used, and in six weeks, I filled a room and had a $120,000 conversion over a weekend. So it's definitely a profitable engagement. And it really, the, the program fits within the terms and conditions of LinkedIn. So it's not a spam type program. It's all about the messaging. So we actually offer training for people. But I wanted to offer this to others because it definitely worked with me and we can help people grow their LinkedIn account as well as turn the the LinkedIn account as a way to really bring in qualified leads that are ready and you can target and find those specific customers you're looking for. So I'm happy to share that with you as well. And you can go to www.linkedin-success.com if you want more information. And then from a standpoint as parents, we've talked about kids earlier in the show. I have no relationship to this this particular website, but there's a website called myjobchart.com. And it's a way for parents to help their kids through chores and jobs and earn money and get them into the right path. And I think it's been highly successful. So I want to share that, myjobchart.com. And then I invite everybody to join me at SharonLector.com. I really like the LinkedIn resource. I'm probably going to go check that out. I found myself using LinkedIn more and I pretty quickly found get rich education type of posts and material do not resonate with Facebook friends, but they do with LinkedIn connections. Exactly. It's a higher level qualified lead by every account. You know, Sharon, I was thinking before I interviewed for 40 some episodes now, I've thought about the guests I've hosted on the show and I've got to say, you're probably... No, you're certainly the most accomplished one. So thank you so much for sharing some of your experience with our listeners. Well, it is my pleasure, Keith, and thank you for what you're doing, because the more of us that get out there and share information to help others find the path for their own success, the better the world will be. So thank you for what you do, Keith. Check out all of Sharon Lecter's great resources at SharonLecter.com where there's a photo with Sharon and the president in the White House together. She's got free videos to watch over there and just loads of great resources at that website. Sharon hosts a podcast called Your Money, Your Life. She's got an acclaimed board game called Thrive Time for Teens. And Sharon's work has appeared nearly all over the place. CNN, Fox Television, Forbes, Oprah, Money Magazine, Yahoo!, Sharon's got 100,000 Twitter followers, a near library of award-winning books that she's written both within and outside of the Rich Dad series and the Think and Grow Rich series. Yes, and somehow there's still only one of her. So check out Sharon's work. And hey, how about all the smart, successful female guests on GRE lately? We've recently had Rich Dad advisor Lisa Lannon and Beth Clifford, Gina Lofton. And thanks today to the talented Sharon Lecter. So, gosh, I love hearing from all these intelligent women. It appears that the Panama Coffee Farm Tour will be in November. The exact date should be announced soon. I'll let you know. The next couple weeks, we're coming back with more hardcore investing topics. Until next Friday, like Sharon Lecter says, you are the CEO of your life. And like I say, don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to visit iTunes and leave your comments.
Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC exclusively.